I'm going to open in prayer, and we'll begin with our word for today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Lord, that you have ordained this day, the Sabbath. You have declared it to be separate from the rest of the mundane week. This 24-hour period of time that you have declared holy. A time for us to come together as, as a body of Messiah. Lord, that we come together and we fellowship with one another and with you, Lord. That we sit at your feet. That we drink in the presence of, of your spirit. Lord, that we find uh, our peace and our fulfillment and satisfaction in you alone. That you are our strong tower, our mighty shield. You are our resting place. Father, we seek your spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Father, I ask that you would open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds so we could be in the proper position to receive all that you desire for us to have on this day. Father, lift up this time to you that you alone would be glorified, that you'd be magnified, that you'd be exalted, worshipped, adored, honored, cherished, praised, that you would be raised above all other things, Lord, and held in the highest of regard because you alone are worthy and of all the glory and honor. And I thank you in the name above all the names that of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 Well, for the past couple of weeks, as we've been uh, going through our season of the Omer and, and preparing for the Feast of Shavuot that has just passed us uh, this past week, uh, we've been speaking a lot about our need for a more intimate relationship with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And... If we are ever to grow and walk in the anointing of the Ruach, there's two things that is required of every believer, and that is a willing heart and availability. Those are two things that we must have. We must have a willing heart, and we must make ourselves available. And one thing that will come into direct opposition to having that willing heart and making ourselves available is personal comfort zones. Those comfort zones that we get into where it's hard for us to uh, dig ourselves out of. Um, and it's amazing that we'll fight and struggle and kick and scream so much to want to remain inside of the comfort zones of our lives. And for all of us, our comfort zones are different. Um, but if we're ever going to uh, rise up and, and be all that we can be uh, for Adonai and, and fulfill our purpose, we need to be able to escape or leave these comfort zones. Our comfort zones are what I like to call the great exodus of our personal lives. Uh, leaving our comfort zones behind. When we think of the exodus, we think of the Israelites and how they left Egypt behind. And we need to leave our comfort zones behind. So for all of us, it's a personal exodus, a great exodus that we all must undertake if we're going to be set free so that uh, we have nothing um, holding us down. Uh, if we allow ourselves to dig into our comfort zones, and sometimes we'll do that, we'll dig in uh, like a trench because we don't want to leave. And if we allow ourselves to dig in like trenches, um, it becomes difficult for us to move and respond quickly when Adonai is calling us to fulfill whatever his desire is, the will. If he's calling us to do something and he has a, a plan for us, it's hard for us to respond if we're dug into our comfort zones like a nice trench where we got ourselves really locked down. Um, and comfort zones are going to attack our willingness and it's going to suppress our availability. And we have to remember that our God is a get up and go kind of God. He told Abraham to go to a foreign land away from his family. He told Jonah to go, and Jonah was to go visit a, a city that was full of sinners. He told Ananias to go, and Ananias was supposed to go to Rav Shaul who at the time was, was known as a murderer of all the early believers. So you can see why he may have a little bit of apprehension, because everyone that came in contact with Paul was, was put to death. Uh, and also he had told uh, you know, Mary and Joseph to go, and uh, 
they fled the uh, Herod, and they were uh, sent to a foreign land. They, had, they went down to Egypt for a time. But our God is a, is, he's a get up and go God. He has a plan for, for everything, a purpose for everything, and a time for everything. And he's always trying to move us into the next level in, within our own personal lives and our personal walk. He's trying to move us into the next level of wisdom, the next level of knowledge and understanding and love and thinking, the next level of faith, the next level of revelation, and so on and so on. And we can't move from one level to another if we don't possess a willing heart and we don't make ourselves available. Because Adonai wants us to grow. He wants us to mature uh, spiritually. He wants us to reach our full potential for the kingdom. And you don't reach your full potential for the kingdom if you've really anchored yourself in, into your personal trenches, into our comfort zones. If we have these comfort zones, we don't respond. And if we do, we, it takes us longer to respond. And when, if it takes us longer to respond, then we're not acting when Adonai wants us to act. We're not going when he wants us to go. We're not doing the things he wants us to do in his time. And then we start to play the delay game. And when that happens, uh, we fall short of experiencing everything that he desires for us. And when we sit there and we vacillate back and forth as to whether we should get up and go or not, because we're, we're just enjoying our comfort zones too much, this delay allows time for the enemy to come in. It doesn't take much. It just allows him to have that little bit of time where now he can come into, uh, into your mind and he could start to put fear and doubt into, and, and give you a list of reasons as to why you shouldn't go or why you shouldn't respond to the plans and the will of Adonai. So these comfort zones can be very uh, dangerous for us. Um, and that's what I want to look at over the next uh, you know, several weeks. We want to look at uh, these comfort zones and how they, can, uh, how they can hinder our walk and be detrimental to us. And again, a comfort zone is anything that is a hindrance to our arriving or receiving the full blessings of Adonai. Comfort zones can be people, places, or things that will hinder us or prevent us from reaching further in our walk with Adonai. And the beauty of the comfort zone is that it is entirely under our control. So we don't need to wait on somebody else to do something in order for us to be released and set free of a comfort zone. It all rests on our shoulders individually. Comfort zones are a mental decision that we make. And we need to have a renewed mind in order to overcome a comfort zone. Comfort zones will dull our senses. Uh, there's nothing stimulating about a comfort zone. There's nothing challenging about a comfort zone. When you're in that environment, that comfort zone environment, there's nothing challenging there. There's nothing stimulating. Because the comfort zone, it, it just sustains you and, and suppresses you and keeps you on what, wherever you're at. Uh, comfort zones are going to dull our senses. And what they become essentially is, is self-made prisons. Self-made. Nobody else can do this to us. Our comfort zones are created by us, and the only way that we can escape it is, is through our action, not waiting on other individuals. And fear will keep us in our comfort zones. Fear of stepping out. Fear of, well, what might happen? Well, the Lord's sending me to go somewhere and do something. Well, I'm afraid to go because I don't know what's going to happen. And it's that fear that can, can leave us trapped. It's that fear that can, that can keep us in that comfort zone from, from not stepping out of that boat, so to speak. Um, as vessels, we're called to be water walkers, not sitting in boats as spectators, watching someone else experience the miraculous power of Adonai. 
you know, and a perfect example of that is Peter with the disciples. And, you know, he's the only one that steps out onto the water. And he took that step of faith. And what's interesting is that, you know, we always talk about Peter and we talk about how he stepped out. And then we always want to bring up how he, he failed to keep his eyes on Adonai and on Yeshua and started sinking in the water and cries for help. And, you know, we kind of give him a negative slant for that. But the reality is, is that the other 11 never even left the boat. But we don't really talk about them that much. They never left the boat. It was never a consideration for them. And, you know, many times for us, that's what the comfort zone is. It's, it's just that it's that refusal to budge. It's that refusal to want to get out of that boat. And a comfort zone, again, you're not going to grow in a comfort zone. And we have that choice of either sitting in the boat and being a spectator, and we watch somebody else that got out of the boat, stepped out of their comfort zone, and, and is, is uh, being used uh, th uh, for, uh, by Adonai, that he works through them to do such great and wondrous things. And then what happens is we become spectators to that. And we go, wow, look what they did, and look what this and that. And meanwhile, they didn't do anything, but it was the anointing and the power of God working through them. All they did was two things. They had a willing heart and they made themselves available. That's all they did. And for so many people, we sit back at times and we just watch other people do something. And we watch other people uh, being uh, worked through mightily by Adonai. Somebody else becomes the world changer and we don't change anything. And we watch somebody else make an impact for the kingdom, and then we look at ourselves and we don't do anything. And the only difference between the world changer and the sustainer is a willing heart and availability, stepping out of the comfort zone. There's no growth in comfort zones. You'll never grow in the comfort zone, in whatever the area is in your life. A comfort zone is like a spiritual coma. You just exist at a certain level. And you're not, you're not moving forward. You're not developing. You're just existing. And that's the danger of, of these comfort zones. And that is the reason why we need to leave them. We should never be comfortable to that extent. A comfort zone is like placing a lid on your vessel. We're vessels of honor. And as vessels, we're meant to be filled so that we could pour out what we've received to the others. But if I have, that, if I have a particular comfort zone, I'm just putting a lid on that vessel. And if there's a lid on a vessel, well, then it can't be used because nothing can be poured into it and nothing can be poured out of it. So that vessel becomes useless. It serves no purpose. We're not meant to be storage containers that sit around collecting dust as a vessel. We're meant to be distribution containers, to be filled and then to release. If we place that lid on our vessel, then we can't be completely filled. That means that we're not open to the who, the when, and the where, and the hows that Adonai wants us to partner with him to make a difference. Comfort zones will keep us in that spiritual Egypt. And the Lord is trying to take us much farther and beyond he wants us to grow. He wants us to develop. He wants us to be a world changer. And you'll never see a world changer in a comfort zone. World changers are the ones that are always out of the boat. They step out of the comfort zones. And comfort zones, it, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing because we certainly need, if we're going to escape, if we're going to climb out of that comfort zone, 
we're going to need the help of the Ruach. Because again, it's a spiritual battle. It's, it's a mental battle. So we need that assistance from the Ruach, HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to help us. So I want to take a look at uh, just a couple of how the comfort zones will negatively impact us as believers, as vessels. And the first way that it'll impact us is it provides an excellent breeding ground for excuses. A comfort zone will provide an excellent breeding ground for excuses. You want me to do, I've, well, do what? No, I've never done that before. You want me to go where? No, I've never been there before. Or they'll say, well, it's not my gifting. There's got to be somebody better qualified for this than me. Or I'm too busy. Or I'm too tired. Or I'm too old. Or I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. There's always an excuse in the comfort zone. And if one excuse doesn't work, we always seem to have plenty of backup until we find the right one that, that seems to work for us. And, and eases our guilt. Benjamin Franklin wrote one time that, saying that he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. And we look in scripture and we see an example of, of, of a young person who tried to use the excuse, well, I'm, I'm too young, I'm just a child. And guess what? It didn't work. It wasn't accepted by Adonai. And this was the prophet Jeremiah. And we read in Jeremiah chapter 1 in verse 4, we read, Here is the word of Adonai that came to me. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you for myself. I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. I said, Oh, Adonai Elohim, I don't even know how to speak. I'm just a child. But Adonai said to me, Don't say I'm just a child. For you will go to whomever I send you, and you will speak whatever I order you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, says Adonai, to rescue you. So, Adonai, uh, so Jeremiah has his, his built-in excuse ready to go. Well, I'm just a child. You know, who am I? But God was calling him to be a prophet. Jeremiah was being called to be a prophet to the nations. He wasn't being called to be a priest like his father and his grandfather had been. He was being called to be a prophet. And being a prophet was much more demanding than serving as a priest. A priest's duties were predictable. Everything was written down in the law as to what they do and how they do it step by step. This is how we, you know, this is how we prepare the tabernacle, this is how we perform the, the various sacrificial rituals and duties. Everything is written down in black and white. But for the prophet, he never knows from one day to the next what the Lord will call him to say or to do. And Adonai may assign you a demanding task, but whenever he gives you a task, it's always attached with his promises. And it's his promises with a purpose. See, he says back in verse 5, as we read, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you for myself. See, Adonai knew Jeremiah. He chose Jeremiah. And he appointed Jeremiah. He was known by name, handpicked by Adonai, and commissioned to serve. Age was not a factor for Adonai. And it wasn't a valid excuse for Jeremiah. So when Adonai is calling you to do something, if he desires you to go somewhere or do something or speak to somebody or whatever it is that the Ruach is pressing on your heart that he, that he wants you to do and he's giving you that urge, you got to remember with Jeremiah. This is a job he's giving to you. If he's giving you this job to do, if he's giving you this assignment, whether it's to speak to somebody, to go to somewhere, to do something, he's giving the assignment to you. That means that assignment was made for you. 
it doesn't mean that you, all, you were the closest one around, so he, he just decided to grab you. As if, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to go shopping and for, you know, a dozen apples, and I'll just pick the 12 closest that are, that are there. You were chosen. You were hand-selected to do what he's asking you to do. And he's putting that on the Ruach to put into your heart. I want you to go speak to this person. I want you to go here. These are personal assignments he's giving us. Personal things that he wants us to partner with him. And he's chosen you to do it. And he gives this to us with purpose. He doesn't just say, well, I just want to test to see if they're faithful. Let me just give them something to do. It's not important, but I just want to see if they'll do it anyway. God doesn't operate that way. Everything he does has purpose. So when, he's, when, when the Ruach is, is, is putting something on your heart to go somewhere or to speak to somebody, even if it's to go speak to somebody and whether it's just to give them a kind word of encouragement or a word of comfort or, or maybe to help them in some kind of a way, he's putting that on your heart because that is a plan with a purpose and you were appointed to do that. You weren't just the closest believer around. He does it with purpose. And the promise of Adonai's purpose, it should give us confidence and it should encourage us because we can do what he's asking without any fear and apprehension because we should understand, well, he's asking me to do this. And if he's asking me to do it, he's going to give me whatever I need in order to be successful at doing it. He doesn't send us out on, on journeys or assignments empty-handed. Mm -hmm. Because we're never alone, because the Ruach is always with us. So, we should always have that sense inside of us that when, when, when the Ruach is asking us and putting it on our heart to do something, we should be saying to ourselves, well, I'll do this because I understand the promises. I understand that there's a purpose connected to this and that God has called me to do this. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't have to be something grandiose like, well, God has called Moses to deliver everyone out of Egypt. You know, he's called you maybe just to speak to somebody. He's called you just to speak to somebody for four minutes and bring them a word of encouragement. That's important in the eyes of Adonai. And he's given you the assignment. He's given you the, the ability to do it and, and the means to do it. And it's amazing because here's Jeremiah saying, well, I'm just a child. And yet he's chosen this so-called child, Jeremiah, to be a prophet to the nations. But I'm just a child. See, in Jeremiah's eyes... He sees weakness, and he sees insufficiency. But God doesn't see that. And Adonai has a way of overcoming our weakness and our insufficiencies. Who was David that he was able to slay Goliath? He was just a young boy. But the giant fell. I mean, the David was so small... He couldn't even wear the armor of a, of a man. It didn't fit and it was too heavy. And they're trying to dress him in all this protection. He's like, I can't wear this stuff. It doesn't fit. It's too heavy. All he needed was his sling and some smooth stones. So, so many times we, we will, you know, we'll look in the mirror and we'll see, you know, our weakness and we'll see, you know, lack. Because that's our image. But Adonai's image, you know, he sees you fully equipped and ready for service. It's just a matter of having that willing heart and making yourself available. Second Corinthians 12. We read, yes, I am well pleased with weakness, Rav Shul says, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties endured on behalf of the Messiah, for it is when I am weak that I am strong. And Rav Shaul understood that 
I may be weak, but that's okay because I'm not operating out of my own weakness. When I operate, when I do what, when I am obedient and do what I'm being asked of by the Ruach, I'm not tapping into my own strength, but I'm tapping into the strength and the anointing of, of the one true living God. Amen. So in my weakness, he is made strong. We need to be dependent and reliant upon Adonai and not ourselves. He doesn't give you a job and say, okay, I want you to do this in your own strength. We're vessels. So he gives us the assignment. He's going to fill us with the ability, the strength, the provision. He'll give you the right words. And well, I'm not an eloquent speaker. Don't worry about it. He's going to give you the words. If he's telling you to speak, he's going to give you the words. He's not up there looking, you know, hanging out with angels and saying, hey, watch this one. I'm going to have this guy go say something. And watch how he's just going to put his foot in his mouth and mess this whole thing up. You know, get the popcorn. Let's get ready and watch this. God doesn't work that way. If he gives you, if he gives you an assignment to speak to somebody, you're never alone because the Ruach's there and he's going to give you the words. And all of a sudden you start saying things that are just so wise and so smart and, and you know you're not that wise and you know you're not that smart. <laughs> And then you realize that, wow, you know, this is, this is you know, that was the Lord. He, you know, he was just speaking through me. I was just the vessel to be able to bring a word of comfort to somebody. See, for believers, excuses are not an option. See, an excuse is never an option for a believer because you are never alone, because you have the Ruach, the spirit of the one true living God inside of you. So when he tells Abraham to go, Abraham didn't go alone. When he tells Ananias, listen, I need you to go, you know, go to uh, Paul, go to Saul, Shaul. You mean the guy that's been killing all of us believers? Yeah, I want you to go to him. I'm sending him to you and I want you to go to him. So you want me to expose myself in front of this guy as a believer and this guy kills believers. So you don't want me to just go to him and just disguise myself as just, you know, an, uh, just another person. But I'm to go to this guy as a believer and, and not be afraid. Yeah, that's what I want you to do. Because he's empowering you to do whatever it is. He'll give you the empowerment and the anointing to be successful because he wants you to be successful. Because he wants whatever he's asking you to do to be done and he wants it done right. And he wants it done for the benefit of, of, of whoever's involved and, and, and for the glory for him. So he's going to give you everything that you'll need. But we need a willing heart and, and make ourselves available. And comfort zones will block that. Yes. In that comfort zone is where the excuses come out. Mm -hmm. Another thing that uh, comfort zones will negatively Im impact us as believers is it'll block advancement and it will block blessings in your life. Again, there is no growth in a comfort zone. You're in that spiritual coma. You just exist. So if I'm just existing, that means I'm not advancing. If I'm just existing, that means that I'm not receiving blessings. Because at any time you receive a blessing from God, it is, it is going to transform you. Every blessing from God is going to have a positive impact on your life. But if I'm in a comfort zone, there is no blessing. Because there is no movement. I just exist. So the comfort zone is, is this place that is absent the blessings of Adonai. Because the blessings of Adonai are always going to have an impact on you in a positive way. We'll stay with our friend Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 29, we read in verse 11, For I know what plans I have in mind for you, says Adonai, plans for well-being, not for bad things, so that you can have hope in a future. See, the comfort zone will keep you from advancing in your walk. It's going to keep you from growing in your faith. It doesn't matter where your faith is at. You could be a new believer or a mature believer. It doesn't matter. Your faith is not going to grow, and it's not going to develop or mature in a comfort zone. But he says, I know the plans I have in mind for you, plans for well-being. That's, that's blessings. That's, that's advancement. 
And it doesn't mean necessarily advancement in a position, but it's just advancement within your own personal life. That I'm growing deeper. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. So advancing, you know, that could be just as simple as within our own personal life, that we're, you know, we're, we're getting more, uh, our faith is growing, we're growing stronger in our faith, we're growing more mature in our walk. And there are times where advancement is going to mean an actual physical advancement, maybe on a societal level. You know, uh, Joseph went from the prison to the palace. That was an actual adv advancement. He had a willing heart and he was available. Adonai has plans with you in mind, for I know what plans I have in mind for you, he says. He has plans with you in mind, just as we were talking about before. He didn't just pick you because you were just the closest person around. He chose you and, and, and ordained for you to be the one to do what it is he wanted you to do, to go to speak to somebody or do something or whatever the case may be. It was a plan that he had prescribed for you personally. And he says, I know the plans I have in mind for you. And sometimes we need to really let that just sit around in our brain and really think about that. He has plans for you. I would hate to get up there someday and have to take a look at all the plans that he had that I never fulfilled. Oh, I had great plans and great dreams for you, but... You tied my hands because you, you refused to leave your comfort zone. I had great plans for you. I had great shoes I wanted you to fill, but you were still in your little baby booties because you never grew. You stayed in your comfort zone. Wherever Adonai wants to take you, wherever it is, Listen, he could, take you into, he could take you into the most dangerous of places. But you don't have to worry. Because wherever Adonai wants to take you is a good place for a good reason. Yes. Because we serve a good God. Yes. It may be a dangerous place. And again, he's not going to take you into a dangerous place unless he knows you're ready for it and you're prepared. But if he takes you to a dangerous place, you'll be all right. Because regardless of the setting, wherever it is, he takes you as a good place because he's present alongside of you. We serve a good God And because he's alongside of you, his anointing is on you and his protection is on you. So he may, he may at some point send you somewhere or ask you to do something where in your own mind you may say, wow, that's a little too heavy for me. Well, maybe he wants you to do this because he wants you to get out of that it's too heavy for me comfort zone. But it doesn't matter where you go because he's there with you. I mean, think about lost the blessings and favor simply because we didn't move out of our comfort zone. He can't reward us for sitting in a comfort zone. He can't bless you because you've chosen to do nothing and be stagnant. You see, if, if we don't step up when he gives us, he has a plan for us. And if we don't move forward with that plan, then we won't be the vessel that he'll use to impact somebody's life. We won't be the vessel that he'll be glorified through because of what's been done. And our faith won't have grown from the experience because there's no growth in a comfort zone. And what will happen is, is that we lose out on all of that because we're in that comfort zone. But it'll still get done because he'll use another vessel to fulfill the plan that he had purposed for you. And, you know, we know that story from the story of Esther. Because ultimately, we lose when we stay in a comfort zone. 
we block advancements, whether you know it's personal advancement in our development. We lose out on blessings because we remain in a comfort zone. Comfort zone is just like a giant anchor that's just stuck in the sand and you're not going anywhere. People are going to be reached and Adonai is going to be glorified, except it'll be through another vessel because you chose to remain in, in your comfort zone. So that's a, a, how it could be detrimental to us. Um, one last one I want to look at today is uh, a, a part of uh, the comfort zone will impede our walk. A comfort zone is stagnation. And it will overtake your thinking and your actions. See, the comfort zone mentality is a mentality of stagnation because there is no growth, there is no development, there's no forward movement. So what happens is that spiritual coma, it just overtakes you. When people are in a coma, their bodies usually don't move. They just, you know, they just sit there laying in the, in the bed. Very little activity going on in the body. And in our comfort zones, we, we purposely enter into that spiritual coma. We become inactive. And that stagnation will prevent you from developing. You'll never challenge yourself to reach farther, dream farther, or achieve farther than you've ever imagined. None of that will take place in the comfort zone. As a believer, as a vessel of honor, we should always be growing in our knowledge of the Lord. We should always be growing and developing our faith and in our walk. As a vessel, we should be like a river. There should be constant activity. You know, water doesn't look like much, but it's very powerful when it's constantly moving. If you want an example of that, just look at the Grand Canyon. What is very powerful because it's moving? It'll cut through rock, but water that stands still, it's not going to have that same impact. As vessels of honor, we should live what I like to call an ING type of lifestyle. We should be seeking that ING ending. We need to be active. We should be seeking the Lord. We should be fellowshipping with the Lord. We should be loving the Lord and others. We should be praying. We should be forgiving. We should be thinking with a renewed mind. We should be reaching out to the Lord and others. We should believe in. We should be sharing, giving. Witnessing, praising, thanking. We should be feeding the new man, the new spirit inside of us. And we should be starving the old man inside of us. And so on and so forth. So we should ha be, have that ING ending with everything that we're doing. Except sleeping. We shouldn't be sleeping as believers. We should be active. Now listen, there, there is a time for standing still. And that comes when the Lord tells you to be still. It's not something voluntary. Well, say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm on vacation right now. Uh, come back in a day or two. And I'll do what you need for me to do. See, when we're in that comfort zone, we don't have that, that ING, that, that mentality, that doing mentality. When we're in a comfort zone, we, have this, we, we, we step ourselves into the sometimes world. The world of sometimes. The sometimes life. Sometimes I seek. Sometimes I pray. Sometimes I give, sometimes I love, sometimes I believe, sometimes I share, 
Sometimes I give thanks. Sometimes is not good enough. Because sometimes is, is a half-hearted life. Sometimes is sitting on the fence where there's indecision. Should I or shouldn't I? But as vessels, we're called to be the hands and feet of Yeshua. He's given us the great commission to, to go out and reach the lost and dying world. And in doing this, we bring glory to God. So the comfort zone will, will create a sense of stagnation in our life, being stuck in the mud. And we're not meant to be stuck in the mud. We're not meant to be pigs stuck in mud. We're meant to be eagles that soar Amen. to greater and greater heights. So these are just uh, three areas of a comfort zone, and we'll continue to look at others and how it impacts us negatively and why we need to be aware of these, and, and we need to be in constant communication with the Ruach and allow him to help us and guide us to get out of these comfort zones that we're in. You know, and sometimes you may or may not be aware of a comfort zone in your life. And that's a good time to ask the Ruach, ask the Lord. What are the comfort zones in my life? Where are the areas of my life that I need to be stepping out of the boat in? Where are the areas of my life that I find myself hesitant when I shouldn't be? Especially when it concerns you know, the Lord and, and what he's seeking for us to do. You know, if we're called to be lights and letting our lights shine in the darkness then we need to be, again, available and willing. Well, I want you to shine your light over in this little dark corner. Well, I don't like that corner. Well, you got somewhere that's less, you know, less demanding, maybe a little closer to home. Maybe I could just do it from my couch. I don't even have to leave my house. You got anything, any assignments like that, Lord? Listen, your television doesn't need being saved. So sitting in front of your television isn't going to do you any good or the TV. The world needs salvation, and the only way it's going to get the salvation is if we actually leave the, leave the house and, and go out to the world. Um, but these are just some ways, and we'll continue to look at others as we, as we go forward. Um, but as we close, I want to extend an offer for anyone that's never received Yeshua, that doesn't have the indwelling of, of the Ruach HaKodesh living inside of them, that doesn't understand and can understand the blessings that we have as believers because of our relationship with Yeshua, having accepted him as our Lord and our Savior. So if anyone has never received Yeshua into their life, asking him to come into their heart and be, be Lord over them and submit to him, I give this opportunity for you to do so. Today is the day of salvation. There is no guarantee of another opportunity tomorrow because there is no guarantee of a tomorrow. The time is now, as the prophet Isaiah says. Today is the day. Seek him while you can. Call on his name while he is near. So for anyone who's never received Yeshua and would like to, then, then follow me in this declaration, this prayer acknowledging who Yeshua is and what he has done and who we are and what we cannot do. To Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner and I know I can't save myself. I know that my sin has separated me from you. And I understand that the only way to be reconciled back to you in a relationship is the way that the only way that you provided, which was through your son, Messiah Yeshua who came and died on the execution of stake, sacrificing himself so that I may receive eternal life. And that through his death, he paid the penalty for my sin, a debt that I could never repay on my own. But because of his payment, I now have eternal life. I now have reconciliation with you. 
I now have the Ruach HaKodesh living inside of my heart. I now am a new creation with a new beginning and my past no longer exists. I am no longer under the curse of sin and death because of what Yeshua has done. So I ask Yeshua to come into my heart. I ask him to be Lord over my life. I submit myself to him. And I acknowledge that he is my Lord and that he is my Savior. I thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation that you freely give that none of us can accomplish, that none of us can satisfy, but only through your Son, Yeshua, as the only way, as the only method, that he alone brings eternal life. So I thank you, Father, for giving us your Son so that may we may be together again for all eternity. And I thank you for this new beginning. And I thank you for the gift of Yeruach HaKodesh, who now lives in my heart, to be my guide, my teacher, to be my comfort and my strength. And I give you all the glory for these things. And I praise your great and mighty name. And I thank you in the name above all the names that of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. I just want to close with the ironic benediction and welcome everybody to stay for our time of food and fellowship, our monthly oneg. Adonai said to Moshe, when you speak to the children of Israel, you are to bless them in this manner. Yere Radonai Panavelech of Echunecha, Yisar Adonai Panavelech, Vesim Lecha, Shalom. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. 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 Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Munch, enjoy. Ha, 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 ha.